In Indochina, I drained a magic potion, a loving cup which I have shared since with many retired Koran and officers of the Foreign Legion whose eyes light up at the mention of Saigon and Hanoi. French Indochina cast a spell over Graham Greene. Its people, its landscape, its opium dens, and of course its wars captivated the English writer, sweeping him away on an intoxicating journey. At journey's end, Greene had harvested the grist for one of his most celebrated novels. A work of remarkable foresight the quiet American stared down the future and foretold the terrible tragedies that lay ahead, born of Washington's meddling in a nation it didn't understand. On a set in Old Hanoi, Australian director Philip Noyce is a picture of jagged intensity. For the past five years, filming The Quiet American has been his passion. All right, straight in the camera. Here we go. Hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. Time and here is a novel that asked and answered the question before it even became a question a novel that looked into the future um, and, and explained why America would prosecute this war against Vietnam for so long and so vehemently. What in the American psyche, in the personality of the post-war Americans that drove them to prosecute that war in that way? I, I live at the press I found my spiritual home. <laughs> The Quiet American tells the tale of jaded English journalist Thomas Fowler, a figure closely based on Green and his own experiences in Indochina. Well, I, I know all the Graham Greene stuff, and I know this book in particular. And uh, um, I really, I, I've met Graham Greene a few times. I'm kind of basing myself on him, except he was six feet five, I'm, I'm only six feet two. With the keen eye of a journalist and a former intelligence agent, Green watched as the French fought vainly to hold on to their prized colony, and as a small band of American advisers began to plot their future ill-fated campaigns. And action! Seeking refuge from a faltering love affair, Green also reveled in, as he put it, the measure of danger brought to a visitor with a return ticket out of a war zone. Green was very much on the edge, but he was always attracted to danger and death. Everyone was potentially your enemy because no one knew who was on the communist side and no one knew who was on the French side in terms of Vietnamese. Um, death could strike at any moment in a dance hall, in a bordello, in an opium den. Um, and maybe tonight will be your last night, so you'd better spend it well. By his own account, Green spent his nights very well indeed. In the crowded streets of Saigon's Chinatown, he discovered a balm to soothe his torment. Green would later write that of the four winters he spent in Indochina, opium has left the happiest memory. After two pipes, I felt a certain drowsiness. After four, my mind felt alert and calm. Unhappiness and fear became like something dimly remembered which I had thought important once. I, who feel shy at exhibiting the grossness of my French, found myself reciting a poem of Baudelaire to my companion, that beautiful poem of escape, Invitation au Voyage. When I got home that night, I experienced for the first time the white night of opium. Oh, 
Philippe Caron crossed paths with Graham Greene, frequenting many of the same haunts. Fifty years ago, as a young man looking for adventure, he came to Indochina to fight in the war. For his bravery on the battlefield, he was awarded his country's coveted Legion of Honor. Now he's returned to Saigon to reclaim some of the vestiges of his youth, to stroll down the old Rue Katina, where he and Green once stayed in apartments overlooking the Orient's most fashionable street. Yes, it was uh, very pleasant with uh, very beautiful shops. And uh, there were no motorbikes uh, at the time. Uh, it was uh, almost entirely French. And maybe it was uh, for this uh, British guy, like crossing the channel and, uh, and going to, uh, to a small, uh, small town in France. And uh, the Brits always uh, did like this exercise. As the tropical sun sank over this alluring river port, Green would often retire to the bar of the Continental Hotel. Known to all as the Continental Shelf, it was here that war correspondents, soldiers and spies gathered to slake their thirsts. What did you make of him when you met him? You met him here at the Continental Hotel? At the Continental. I was a very shy midshipman and uh, he was already a celebrity and uh, chatting with his friend uh, Lucien Baudard, who was also a war correspondent already very well known. Uh, Lucien was doing the show, uh, speaking a lot, very, with a wild imagery. And uh, uh, Graham was um, rather silent, and, but uh, drinking as much as Lucien. But just outside the graceful confines of the French quarters, Vietnam was a country at war. From the rooftop of another of Green's watering holes, the Majestic, patrons could watch American military equipment being unloaded on the quays below. They were bringing uh, uh, what uh, we had uh, dearly asked, uh, mainly uh, planes and uh, modern uh, weapons and ammunition and all sorts of uh, uh, supply like trucks, jeeps and uh, things like that. Later, the Americans would send troops as well, hundreds of thousands of them. But back then, it was Frenchmen like Philippe who fought and died along these waterways, given up to the clammy mists of war. It was here in the Red River Delta that Green came to witness the fighting a land where cathedrals loom out of the emerald paddy, this was once the cradle of Vietnamese Catholicism. In Green's day, the local bishops wielded the powers of feudal kings. They were part of Vietnam's unruly political patchwork, making enemies of both the French and the communists. Here, within the gates of the sullen stone basilica at Phat Diem, Green once sought refuge to watch combat on the surrounding plains. From the bell tower of the cathedral at Fatien, I could contemplate a panorama of war that was truly classical, the kind that historians or war correspondents used to describe before the era of the camera. Howitzer shells exploded in little clouds, hanging motionless for a moment in the calm air above the plain as in a painting. But down on the muddy plains of the Delta, an ugly, unrelenting struggle was underway. On patrol with foreign legionnaires, Green was able to see the war at closer quarters. French losses were rising sharply. By 1952, about a thousand officers had been killed, the equivalent of two entire graduating classes in the Army Academy at Saint-Cyr. For most, it was a lonely death in the turbid waters of a rice paddy 
or a jungle thicket, half a world away from the comforts of Paris. Well, it was a, a, tough, uh, a tough one, uh, but uh, the French who were here were not uh, draft uh, people, they were professional, they were legionnaires, and uh, they were good, darn good. Opposing them were disciplined guerrillas under the charismatic leadership of the nationalist Ho Chi Minh. Men like Lu Huan Tran, who still bears the scars of the fierce fighting all those years ago. Bị thương lúc ấy tôi là trung đội phó, thì dẫn một tiểu đội đánh vào chính diện, tức là vào khẩu súng trung như trung liên ấy, ném lựu đạn vừa ném xong thì bị thương luôn. Tin tưởng là vì mình lúc đấy chỉ tay không mà cầm súng bác súng không có mác lào với kiếm mà chiến thắng được kẻ thù lớn mạnh vậy thì rất khoát nếu là dân chúng mình đoàn kết thì tất cả dù sức mạnh mấy cũng sẽ đánh thẳng. Tragically, the truth of Tran's words had to be learned twice over, first by the French, then by the Americans. In 1952, a massive bomb went off in Saigon Square, striking terror into the very heart of the French enclave. In The Quiet American, Green blames the blast on the Americans and their efforts to create a so-called third force, a force opposed to both the communists and French colonialism. I can't! In the first celluloid version of the novel, filmed on location a mere five years after the bomb went off in the square, the meddling of the Americans is seen through the character of Alden Pyle, a young aid worker whom Fowler suspects is a US intelligence agent. The clash between the idealistic hubris of Pyle's new world and the cynical rail politic of Fowler's Europe is a constant theme. Isn't it just possible that there's a third choice? A third force. Third force? 22 million Vietnamese deciding for themselves how they want to live. You must remember that for Americans, figures have magical meanings. A third force, five freedoms, and lucky seven, and two for the price of one. Hmm? It was here at Tain Inn, amid what Green describes as the full Asiatic splendor of a Walt Disney fantasy, that the Americans thought, for a time at least, they might create their third force. Founded in the 1920s, the Cao Dai sect embraces an exotic cocktail of faiths, Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity among them. Its clergy includes a pope, cardinals, and female priests, and the great eye of God follows their every movement. Among the sect's minor saints is none other than the French poet Victor Hugo. The Cao Dai professed to be a world religion founded on peace. But in Green's day, the sect had an army of 20,000 men, led by a renegade commandant with good anti-communist credentials. His name was General Tay. In The Quiet American, it is General Tay, armed with American explosives and support, who sets off the bombs in Saigon Square. You must be out of your mind. Look, you put your General Tay on that, all right. Look, that red color on the street, there's, there's your third force. And those things being carried by on stretchers, there's your national democracy. Why don't you shut up? For once in your life, why don't you just shut up and help somebody? 
Go home to Fuang and tell her about the heroic dead. A few dozen less of her country people to worry about. In the end, Pyle's messianic mission to help save the Vietnamese from the clutches of communism leads to his murder. His death becomes a powerful metaphor for the ultimate failure of US policy in Indochina. Just like Pyle, America was stumbling blindly into a fight it couldn't win. Graham Greene was able to describe the fundamental principles of American foreign policy that have existed since 1950 right up to the present day. Um, the question of whether the means are justified by the ends. In other words, whether you are right in doing anything to achieve what you consider to be a goal that is for the good of mankind or the good of another country. Um, basically, uh, whether America should play puppeteer in other people's business. Graham Greene made his last trip to Indochina in 1955. It was also the year The Quiet American was published. Then, tragically little was known about the nationalist struggle in Indochina, but in the United States, Greene's novel was dismissed as anti-American. Had more of the politicians and generals who prosecuted the war read this prophetic book, their eyes might have been opened to the impending nightmare into which their country was about to descend.